Years back, I was asked to write a review of a book on positive psychology, the psychology of how people find happiness, and to approach it from a Buddhist point of view. And one of the things I noticed as I was reading through the book was there's no consideration of what the impact of your search for happiness might be. Of course, the, the writer as a psychologist was trying to be morally neutral, which is supposedly scientific. But there's no consideration at all that your search for happiness might harm other people. So I pointed that out, that from a Buddhist point of view this is a huge gap and a huge missing part of the equation. The editor of the magazine said he was surprised that I had taken the position that karma was the issue that was missing. He was looking for something more along the lines of emptiness, say. Or the Bodhisattva vowed that you shouldn't be looking for happiness anyhow. Well, I was surprised that he was surprised. Because from the very beginning, the teaching was all about karma. And that's how the, the Buddha differentiated his teachings from others. He, he was a Gamawadi, someone who spoke of karma, taught karma. This relates to another surprising incident. I was another time asked to give a talk on karma to a group of meditators to talk about the relationship between karma and meditation. I was talking about how the teachings on karma are all designed to show that it is possible to master a skill. If karma, at least as the Buddha taught, if karma were totally deterministic, there'd be no reason to teach at all. After all, people couldn't change their ways. Everything they did was totally predetermined. If everything were totally random, there'd be no ability to develop a skill either. Because one thing you might master today wouldn't mean anything tomorrow if everything changed. Everything was totally random. The way the Buddha taught, which is that past actions have an influence on the present, but the present moment is also shaped by your present actions, your present decisions, and you have some freedom in shaping those present decisions. It's precisely that understanding of karma that allows a skill, allows you to develop skills. And I kept getting blank looks. I found out later that this group of people had been taught that meditation was not about doing anything at all. You're not supposed to do in meditation, you just be. But that sets you up for all kinds of problems. Because if you're going to understand concentration as you attain it, you have to understand it as a kind of action. Otherwise you hit some non-dual states and you think you've run into the non-duality at the basis of all reality. And then you get stuck. But if you see that even non-dual is a perception, it's a fabrication, it's an action, then you can take it apart. So the teachings on action, on karma, really are relevant to how we meditate. First, just the basic principle of developing a skill. You look at your actions and notice the effect that they have both immediately and long-term. Think of the Buddha's instructions to Rahula. Before you act, ask yourself, what's your intention? Because after all, the intention is the karma, determines the quality of the karma. If it's going to harm anybody, don't do it. If it harms yourself, harms other, don't, others, <clears throat> don't do it. Why you're acting, look for the results that are coming immediately, because sometimes some of the results do come right away. You put your finger on a stove and it's not going to wait until the next lifetime before it burns. Other times, though, you won't see the actions and until a later time, so you've got to look for those long-term results, too. If you see that it was a mistake, if you see that it was a mistake while you're doing it, you stop. If you see it was a mistake after you did it, you resolve not to repeat that. And that's how you learn. That's how you learn any skill. That's not the case that the Buddha leaves you to explore everything. He says there are certain things you just don't want to do, and that you don't want to break the precepts. You don't want to engage in the wrong speech, not only of lying, but also of divisive speech, 
harsh speech, idle chatter. And you avoid greed, ill will, and the view that karma, your actions don't make a result, <clears throat> don't make a difference. Those things you don't have to test, just use them. But you find there are a lot of other things that you have to test in practice. As you get more and more sensitive to the impact of your actions. It's important that you understand what harm means here. As the Buddha said, if you break the precepts, you're harming yourself. It's interesting. You kill other people, kill other animals. You say you're really doing harm to yourself. They get killed once, but you can have a long, long time of suffering because of that. If you want to harm other people, he said, you get them to break the precepts. Because remember, they're agents too. They're creating karma, and they're going to be experiencing happiness or pain based on their actions. So when you're thinking thoughts of goodwill for yourself, you're basically thinking, may I act in a skillful way so that I can create the causes for happiness. And you think the same for other people. May they act in skillful ways too. And that's a thought you can have for even people that you really find destructive and horrible and cruel. Your goodwill for them expresses that itself that way. May they understand the causes for to happiness, have the strength and the willingness to act on them. So, but the important principle is that you're working on skills, learning how to be more skillful in how you do things, more skillful in how you say things, more skillful in how you think, how you order your mind. And this is where karma comes into the meditation. Particularly when you engage in directed thought and evaluation. Some people say that when you get into the first jhana, the directed thought and evaluation is just kind of unfortunate, wobbly, or unsteady part of the, the concentration. But actually, it's, it's the work of right resolve. And the Buddha said, noble right resolve is the directed thought and evaluation in your concentration. And what are you evaluating? You're evaluating your actions. You sit here and you choose to focus on the breath. That's an intention right there. And the next question is, how do you maintain that intention? How do you keep supporting it with other skillful intentions? And this is where you have to deal with the different techniques of how you get the mind to settle down, how you focus on the breath, how you focus on the parts of the body, whichever topic you choose as your theme. And then you make adjustments, both in the mind and in the theme, so that they fit snugly together. And then do your best to maintain that, to keep an interest in that. Learn how to ask questions about what you're staying with. And one of the big questions is, to what extent is there still some disturbance in this state of concentration? Then you notice that the disturbance is in what you're doing. So is there something that you're doing that you can drop and still stay concentrated? In the beginning, you don't want to drop things too fast, because it requires a fair amount of directed thought and evaluation to get everything together. The Buddha's image is of a bathman. A bathman in those days would prepare your soap dough for you. Instead of having a bar of soap, they would have some powder and they'd mix it with water and create kind of a dough, not bread dough. Then you'd rub that over your body as you were bathing. And the bathman's job was to knead the water into the dough so everything was well mixed, like bread dough again. You want to make sure that all the, the flour has been moistened, but you don't want things to drip out. You want everything just right. So the bathman has to work the water through. In the same way the Buddha says you work the sense of ease and well-being, the sense of rapture. As it develops in your concentration, you have to work that through the body. Because in the next step, you want to be able to just sit there in the same way that you feel like the body is a large lake and it's being fed by a spring of water. In this case, you're not outside of the the dough working the water in, you're actually there Im totally immersed in the water. The water here stands for pleasure. 
then you're not going to be able to feel immersed in the water of pleasure unless you've been working it through the body. This is why John Lee talks about the various breath energies and breath channels in the body. They give you some ideas about how you might direct that sense of ease to the body or think of it spreading through the body to work its way around any pains you may have, to work its way around any sense of blockage. And when everything is well moistened with the pleasure, okay, then you can drop the direct of thought and evaluation, because that's the disturbance there, and then just allow yourself to be immersed in the sense of ease. But you still have to maintain it. You still have to stay with the breath. Otherwise, if you just drift off in the ease, you lose your balance, you lose your focus. And either you just kind of sit there without any real clarity or alertness, or you lose the concentration entirely. So there's still a certain amount of tension in the meditation that requires you to keep the object in mind. Remember, you've got to maintain that intention to stay here with clarity. So it's the same principle that the Buddha taught to Rahula. You do something and you look at the results, and then if the results are not what you like, you change. This is a kind of karma. It's good to keep that in mind, because sometimes you get into these states of non-duality, a sense of the body disappearing. And you think you've hit something cosmic. We just hit another perception. The important thing is that you learn how to keep that questioning attitude in mind. Where is the disturbance still? And look specifically, not so much in things outside, the things are inside the mind. You see this especially clearly when you're working with pain. The real disturbance there is not the pain. It's the mind's commentary on it, the perceptions you're bringing to it. The Buddha has that tetrad in breath meditation where he talks about one, breathing with a sense of rapture, two, breathing with a sense of pleasure, and then three, breathing sensitive to metal fabrication. which are being sensitive to feelings and sensitive to perceptions, and then calming mental fabrication. Well, those first two steps give you the, basically a John Lee's recommendations for how you start working with pain. There may be pain in one part of the body, but you focus on getting a sense of ease and well-being in another part of the body. And then the next two steps. You're basically Jamahabua's approach, which is you notice, okay, here's the pain, but what are the perceptions? What are the perceptions that make that pain a mental issue? Learn how to question them. That's how you calm them. In other words, you replace a disturbing perception, a disturbing one that says, the pain is in my mind, the pain hates me, the pain is after me, whatever crazy ideas you may have about the pain. And a lot of those crazy ideas are hidden behind some more sane-sounding ideas. But even the idea okay, that the pain has invaded your leg. Your leg is still a leg. The pain is something that's coming and going, but it's something different. If you can learn how to use that perception, that perception is calming. The mind can then stay with the pain and not feel pained by it. So here again, it's a question of your actions, those perceptions that you choose. They're determining whether you're going to suffer from things here in the present moment or not. All too often we don't think we have a choice. We have our old set of perceptions. We're equipped with perceptions we've picked up from who knows when. And for most of us that's what reality is. But what it says, you can question them, replace them with new ones and they'll have a different impact on the mind. So in all these ways you have to keep remembering it. As you meditate, you're engaged in karma, you're engaged in actions. And there are things that you can do more skillfully. You'll give it results in the immediate present and results on into the future. And we all want happiness. 
But our problem is that we act under the influence of ignorance. We don't see how our perceptions and how our thoughts are shaping reality. All we see is the product. We don't like it. Sometimes, sometimes we like it, sometimes we don't. But it seems to be like a crapshoot. You never know what's going to come up. It's because you're not paying careful attention to what you're doing. Working from your physical actions on into your verbal and then into your mental actions. But the meditation gives you a sensitivity to those mental actions. And also, the teaching on karma reminds you that you can change what you're doing right now. You do have that freedom of choice. And the meditation, by making you more sensitive, more mindful, more inquisitive, puts you in a position where you can take more and more advantage of that freedom.